And we welcome in the former head coach of the Sioux City Musketeers and current head coach of the Minnesota State Mankato Mavericks, Luke Strand. Uh, Luke, as always, fantastic to catch up with you. You guys too. Obviously a very meaningful place in my uh, journey of time, so exciting. Uh, I guess we got to start off with, I mean, you, 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 you're in the office, uh, the purple's behind you. you, you landed the job at, uh, Mankato. It, it was kind of a whirlwind for you, a very, uh, last second deal. Kind of take us behind the scenes of how that all unfolded and how you ended up as the, uh, the top man there at, uh, Minnesota state. And before that, just like the timeline, because this is an epic turn. I mean, we're talking about this happened, bam, bam, right now, done. I was minding my own business. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, our, our Ohio State season had ended. Uh, we lost in the in the regional final to go to the Frozen Four. Came back, knew that we had to do exit interviews and had to get on the road to wrap up some recruiting things. Um, and the process was wrapping up to try to get back and, and make sure our house got cleaned in, in a spot where we could sell it in Sioux City so we could get officially moved to Columbus. Um, and in that five day window, um, they had called asked for permission and it was probably about a three and a half day span of between calls, zooms, no face to face. I didn't come see campus. Um, it just was, it was the right time and the right fit. What was it that made you say yes to Mankato? Well, I mean, what they've done here has been incredible. There, there's that part. I, I think uh, Mike Hastings, the staff, the program put it themselves nationally on a, on a huge scale, totally in the footprint of my life with the proximity to back home in Wisconsin, to Sioux City, uh, to that side of our family and life there. Um, the, I think the proximity to the USHL in recruiting in a lot of ways, um, all of those things came to – to be there. It reminds me of Sioux City. It reminds me of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. It reminds me of the two towns put together. Um, but, you know, finally, like on this whole big picture, like I was probably, I was at Miles in when the offer came. So the, I haven't found Miles in yet, but we're close. Of course. <laughs> it was Brett's fault. Sure. A uh, part of the decision to go to Mankato, what made it probably easier is. A familiar name, at least Alex Tracy and that for you won the Clark cup with you in uh, 2022, you know, I'd been with you for a couple of years. So has to feel good to uh, be reuniting with uh, your, your Clark cup champion netminder in Mankato. Yeah. Very uh, incredibly meaningful. I, I think the idea, um, our, our history, um, my belief in, in that human being for sure, let alone his ability on the ice. Uh, in a quick conversation with him about what's here, he, I've listened to him all year when I've seen him or, or been passing and different things where, where conversations come up about his just pure joy and excitement for what's here. Um, those things stick with you. I mean, I think there's a lot of former players and even teammates of mine that came through the doors here that really made uh, Mankato really another level of attraction. And then uh, Brendan Olson is here as well. And, mm -hmm. and Ole, you know, part of our, our team the year prior to us winning at the, the cup there, he was part of the brawl team and uh, just an unreal human being on that side. And, and Ole has a, a very great feel for what this place is. And I think when people start to have great experiences in a place, I think your ears really perk up. So you uh, saw a lot of like musketeer DNA in that Mankato locker room, right? That's, that was a big selling point for you. It is. Uh, I think that part of, of the guys, the familiarity and the, the history of the, the, I think the transparency of, of guys going from Sioux city to Mankato, there's been a long pipeline of players that have done so. And, but when you're walking into guys you've coached before that, that's really healthy and, and it makes that transition a lot easier. Let's transition into the Clark Cup conversation now. And I think what we want to hear I, and what is what a lot of other people out there listening want to hear, that's we know facts about goal scores and things like that. But I think what we want to do is we want to peel back the curtain a little bit and give people a look into how it all came about, how it worked, um, the great stories that people haven't heard 
um, of, of last year's team and, and some of those that we can tell um, the other things like that. But before we get to that one, you mentioned the brawl, honestly, Luke, and, and you and I have talked about this before. Are, are the Sioux City Musketeers, were they one fight away with Fargo from winning back-to-back -back Clark Cups? Yeah, I mean, you you hear Fargo say the opposite. They say that we, we took it from them because they had guys suspended. I don't know if we were playing our, our – we, we weren't scoring, and I thought getting to that was very important. And um, quite possibly, you know, that there's just another memory flash that came up of two years prior, Sioux Falls had won the Cup. Um, we lost back-to-back -back overtime games in, in the initial first round of that playoff. Yes. Um, you know, one I think was in three or four overtimes, and the one was in double overtime. It's like – so that team steamrolls the rest of the USC till and wins a the cup. They didn't win. They didn't lose another playoff game. They Correct. swept something else beyond that. Yeah. And um, it, to secret to that would be like when Scotty Owens retired, I asked him a long – I gave him a project to do for me just to, cause I wanted to mine some information out of what made them successful, where they were at, what it was to play against us, what it meant. And I used so many of, of his thoughts in, in future teams with ours. Um, then there was a COVID year, then there was a brawl team. And then there was a cup. That brawl team, when that brawl happened and you're on the bench, what's going through your mind? I mean, are you, how does that all tra trans? I mean, how does it transpire and, what are you thinking as you're watching it unfold? Um, well, it's it's twofold. I mean, there there's a, I think part of your personality as a coach that probably went out there, and that's probably why they're in it and doing it. <laughs> <laughs> there's part of the personality uh, as a coach. You're like, man, I I thought I taught us a little more discipline than than this. But I'll tell you, if you ever want to peg a team that would do that and, and be that way and stay together that way, it was that group. Yeah. I, I'm fortunate the Clark Cup year, uh, we didn't have the opportunity to get in that because that group was even tighter and probably would have even done more. Correct. Instead Correct. of six guys on the ice, there would have been 22 guys on the ice, my guess. I know uh, one of the guys on that Clark Cup team that would probably love to have started one of those was uh, Ralph Bergmanis. He he uh, he enjoyed a scrap or two. Uh, what's a what's a good uh, Ralphie story that you have for us? Because obviously everybody knows him from you know what he can do with his fists on the ice, but uh, off the ice, what kind of guy is is uh, Bergmanis? Uh, Ralph is a sweet old soul, um, very competitive. Uh, you know. There was times when I had to actually, I knew what we were doing in practice. I would have to switch colors according to the practice to make sure him and Steve had this love affair on the ice that they would fight each other about. They would get into absolute battle with each other to the point where I actually had to put them, if they're both in green or they're both in gray, they were not going to be on the opposite teams when it came to small area. I, one of the funnier Ralphie stories. I was back in exhibition. When I think we played Austin exhibition. The Peter, Peter got run over, and Peter was his buddy from back home. And and I, I just had asked Cole, I'm like, we want to get probably Ralphie off the ice because it's probably not good that he didn't get to the bench before I finished that sentence. And there was Ralphie tearing up a poor young lad and his welcome to America coming out beat up session so yeah and steve's and ralph did drop the gloves in practice one time they did uh they did and you know guys like oh let him go let him go i'm like okay we got problems here we got our <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> hard steady like really talented d and our goal scoring phenomenal forward kind of what they were all about those competitors but yeah that, that was a uh, Please break that up before somebody either breaks a hand or gets a face broke because they were going. So at the beginning of the year, did you have an idea or a thought that this was a team that could make a run and had a legitimate chance to win it? Uh, yeah, I mean, you'd love to say so. I mean, you got to figure the year before we had Akira Net and Akira really ran and took the ball down the stretch and did things he's doing now in the NHL, he's doing in, in the USHL. And Trace – had done some good things and got some miles under his belt because Aki was coming back from injury. So the next year, I think between Axel and, and Trace, you, you probably hope that your goaltending got short up in time. Um, 
we felt that we had a lot of depth and that was a big key for what to Andy's credit was like, we're going to find as thick of lineup as we can, where one can look like four and two can look like one and just make sure that everyone can play in every scenario. And I thought he did a phenomenal job of putting that together. And then I think at the beginning of the year, you're always, we would call it a hit list. Um, not in a bad way. A hit list was the opposite. The hit list was guys that you knew they were out there on other teams, other organizations that you're like, if if there was a chance to get him, that would make us better. And, and frankly, there was there there was a good probably handful that, and then as the year goes on, you kind of narrow that down to the two or the three. And we made some I thought really smart decisions as far as bringing players in and at the right time. Travis, did you share the list of questions? Because, like, that's the next uh, – he, he segued perfectly into that one because that <laughs> I was going to ask, what was the background there of, like, getting those guys, the Fowlers and the Carfanias, you know, adding them to that team? Because, you know, that's when you guys really took that jump. How did they – I guess the question is, how did they get added to the hit list? Had that been, like, months, years in the waiting, and you just finally were able to strike the iron while it was hot? A little bit of – I think there's <clears> – <throat> There's the part like cars, for example, he was very high on our draft list when that when his draft scenario came through. The the talk was he wasn't going to come to the league right away, so that kind of backed us off maybe a round or two. In the meantime, Green Bay grabbed him, and, and COVID like sped up his progress into the league, so he got there a year prior to probably when he was going to arrive, which made the year he came to us a pretty impactful year. That would have in, in our mind that would have been a, his first year but it was actually a second year playing in the league. So we had a good traction on what that was and what he had already started and, and then was looking like. And Fowles was just uh, – Fowles is a kid that you you played against enough on one bench that you're like, okay, enough of playing against that kid. We we want him – when you stand behind your players and the players complain about the guy that's out there for the other team, at some point you're like, okay, let's just beat the system and get him on our side. I remember the day that John's told us that we got Fowler and I said, when have you told the team yet? He was like, no, I'm telling him right now. I'm like, I want to be in there for that meeting because I remember not even looking at John's. I just remember looking over at our players to see the faces and the reactions. And there was about half the room. It was like, yes. And half the room was like, what? Like, like they, they were confused as to how this guy is going to, going to transition into here. Cause there's been so many battles between us and him was there ever a concern that of of him maybe melting well with with who we had in our locker room, or is that just like a is that a hockey thing where you grab a guy that's that nobody really likes on the other team, and all of a sudden he's coming to play for you? Is that a hockey thing where people just accept that immediately, or what's the human the human being aspect of that as well? Uh, it's both. To your point, it's both, and you know we were lucky. Uh, Mikey Adams and Tabes, like some of these guys, knew fouls very tight. We had done enough background on that side of it to see he was committed to Lowell, good program. They definitely would have had a great character check on what was there. Um, and at that point, it was kind of like that was kind of a missing piece. It didn't really matter what the guys thought because it was going to fit anyways. Um, hmm. John's exp explanation in bringing him in was great. John's also like didn't tell the guys was like, we would have taken this kid way earlier if he'd have been available. So you're only getting the tail end of the complaint on, about what he is. So um, just a great kid. But is, I don't know if you remember, do you remember when Mongo came to the locker room? I, I had Steve Montgomery, the ex's manager, come in and he, he just got back to town. I'm like, come on over, like, check it in, you know. And he walked in the room and looked over and saw Fowler's name. And right away, he, he had some choice non-PG words to be like you're that blank 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 player that I watched last year blank blank yes. thank god you're on our team and that's coming from a baseball manager so <laughs> home run would be the understatement you know Fowler what and like what a great way to kind of anoint yourself into the team one of the first games that we played that he played for us was against Omaha and somebody went high on Nikki at center ice and foul didn't even think twice. He dropped the gloves and went after somebody right there against his old team. Like it might've been the same week we, we got him to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I think it's in his DNA. 
uh, the competitiveness, the care. Um, he's a winner. Uh, that that would be a big piece. Uh, and the other, the other part about if you want to talk behind the scenes, like I'd really tell Falls, like you're a good hockey player. We I don't need you to be an idiot. Like don't don't run around and get outside of the box here. Like a lot let those things come to you and if they come to you and you're available for it then that will take care of itself but i do need the pestering player to be on our side and not undisciplined because i would tell him like if i was coaching against you on our team you're on the other team it w- i could get you to take a penalty in a minute if we just asked the guy to go bug you at a face off and right fouls really played good hockey for us besides all the pestering part he became a, a big piece uh down the stretch for us I know a big piece in that Clark Cup winning team was uh, Tabor Heeslip. Uh, I wasn't part of it, but I've heard the stories about game four. He, he gets hit into the boards and uh, refuses stitches. I mean, uh, there, there's one thing of hockey players going into the locker room and getting stitches and coming back in uh, to refuse them all together and then win it and celebrate with everybody with, I mean, I, I've heard the gruesome horror stories, but uh, talk about that moment and the toughness from uh, Tabor Heeslip. This, 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 by the way, is like one of my all-time favorite stories from last <laughs> year. Just out of pure, just out of pure toughness, and it like defines Tabor Heeslip. It really does define him. Um, opposite corner of a bench, far end, he kind of gets dasher parallel to the board, like parallel to the ice almost just a splattering didn't really get checked from behind. I wouldn't say it just probably caught him a little bit aggressive himself, but he led with his face on the wall in, in, I wish there was a, this would be a great time trap for a picture to show up. I have, I, yeah, I have pictures. You, like, you'll see them right now. You, you'll, you'll tooth cut in half, lip split, blood everywhere. I, the, visor, I... the visor key. He got a pressure cut up here. So by the time he got to the bench, his visor looked like, instead of like putting Windex on a visor, it looked like that was just blood. Full screen of blood on uh, on that. Um, as a coach, like, okay, he's out. That's a that's a conky. That's a whatever. Something's going to happen. And he came back and he met with Jackie for uh, not very long. Mm-mm. And Tabe came. I'm like, I looked at. I remember looking at Jack. I'm like, what are we? He's like, he's checked out. Fine, he's good. Like, he's just gross. Like, look at him. He's just because he was a mess. Um, he was. Uh, he was a mess. He was a he's, mess. I like. He's fine. He's just gross. He, he, <laughs> I mean, we, she's trying to get blood off his jersey and whatever, whatever. And I mean, he. I don't know. It was about as fast as a NASCAR change for the pit stop because he got right back out there. And at the end of the game you didn't realize how bad it was until you slowed it down and then start to look at like the cuts now back open again. And it looks like a Pac-Man mouth uh, mm-hmm. on his ear. His mouth doesn't even look like a human mouth. It looks like, I don't know, a Rocky scene back in the day from a boxing match. He had four, his four front teeth Just were broken, broken in half. Broken in half, even like diagonal. Yeah. He, I don't know. He celebrated pretty healthy. Yeah, he did. He did, as as most of us did. But there was every 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 team that wins a championship has a turning point or a moment when you kind of know, like, all right, we have a legitimate chance right now. Like, like this is the group that we we can do this. Where was that point in the season for you when you when you thought, you know what, we have a legitimate shot to win this thing? Um, I can tell you, it's February sixth. At Lincoln, I, I, I wow. it's in my phone. Everything I did, and I, I remember asking the guys. We got beat in Lincoln. We just weren't good. We we had already made all of our deals. Like we just, but we had me to make a decision. Like you were either going to be fine with being good, or we really wanted to go for it. That was, and I know we met as a staff and yep. uh, other things that way too. But that was the first, and the first question I asked to the guys i'll read them like what do we want why do we want it what are we willing to do for it? better yet what are you willing to give up for it uh do we have the vision to be the last man standing uh, are we all in we made a promise like that the big thing for me was they had to make a promise that they want to change each other's future 
it, without knowing if the result would be there. But they had to make the promise to each other to go through these steps. The price to pay, what's your sacrifice? Are you willing to check things like ego role? Can you check your focus, social life, uh, workload, your coach Billy can diet, sweat, tear, doesn't matter. Meetings, like we went from having meetings to having like these were wartime meetings now. They weren't they weren't kind of you had to be exact. Um a lot of it was just asking the price you want to pay to be in a championship forever. And I think the biggest piece was alignment. Can we align ourselves in a manner with one direction? that there was no wiggle room for someone else to want to go a different way. And then if there was like, how good were we to put that person back to be in line? And the guys, you know, if they want to write their own story, they had to have no hesitation to do those things. And they had to have, basically I made them make the, the blessing for each other that, that they were going to embrace the suck about how hard it is and really use it for their best ability. And, I don't know if the guys, uh, I could cry. They're, they're unreal. I think unreal of, humans too. Yeah. Unreal human beings. Uh, yeah, that was, I mean, the biggest, the biggest piece of the puzzle wasn't playing ability. That was uh, not to say it the wrong way, but I think every year, if you look back coaching their second halves, we're always, you give me the last 30 games. I bet you we won 20 plus games of those 30 games all the way through basically. And that group was going to have that part. It was just, this group was, they cared and loved each other. Like I would tell you forever that the reason they wanted it is because they loved it more than the other team. Mm -hmm. I, when I talked about the, that moment where, you know, you know, um, for me, it was when we were in tri city and we started making a run at them. They, it was in game three of that final regular season series we had with them. You mean the three and, and three in the regular season? Three and the three and three in the regular season, and um, they did they they cheap shotted Ben Steves on the far wall, and Grant Slukinski dropped his gloves against probably the toughest guy in the U.S. in the USHL, knowing that he's biting off way more than he can chew. But it was just one of those things where Grant dropped the gloves just because he, I think he had a point to prove for our entire team that I, I know that you're probably going to get me here, but you can't do that. And I don't think any other team was willing to do that and play that kind of style against them. And when that happened, I, I'm sure you remember this, um, but when it happened, it, it was just, it, it, it was like this moment where you're like, wow, okay. Like this is legitimately like something we have special here that if Grant's willing to do that, it just shows what kind of team we have. Yeah, the the three and three at the end of the year against the same team on the road. We treated it like a mini playoff series at the time. Let's let's see how close we are to to the needle where we want it to be. Um, that was a big piece. I, I think the guys coming back from big deficit in that series, like we're down maybe four to one or something crazy. We came back and won. I, I know we left there like a lot braver, a lot more believing, and probably. Like, okay, we'll play those guys again, and, and we are just fine to go do that. Because they were really the – they they had an unreal team. And an unreal set records. regular season. Yeah. Yep. I know a big part of that championship team, too, because it's on your championship rings is the, the puzzle pieces. Uh, explain the story behind that for people and, and what the team did, and, and where did you get the inspiration for that? Oh, because I can't sleep. That's why I don't know. The inspiration <laughs> part is like, I think you, you got to see things that are, are, are going to be relatable. Like you, you just do, you, you have to find a way that, and so the puzzle pieces for us were a, for a meaningful part that everyone had a piece of the puzzle. Everyone had a time and a job to do. You had an A game because you had two pieces of the puzzle and your A game had to be there. But if it wasn't there, you for sure, your B game could never leave you. And the guys uh, set up the puzzle every single day. The first day that they did it, I think they thought they were kids in kindergarten because they had a stopwatch. And it took them, like, disgustingly, like, six six minutes. I'm it like, was so painful. We're going to communicate. This is going to be a terrible, terrible <laughs> communication problem. And then uh, they had to set it up every single day. And on the on the puzzle was the words, uh, the, the MBT, not for, for most valuable player, but for most valuable teammate. 
and then the cup itself. And there was no rhyme or reason what piece of the puzzle it had, which was even more beneficial because it, it just meant that everyone had to do their part. We we talk about the, that cohesiveness that, that started to kind of galvanize as the season went on. Um, when when we went to Tri City in in the conference finals, they, it was what, four nothing like in the blink of an eye in that game. I think they scored four goals in the first what, five minutes of the game. You called timeout. What did you say in that timeout to those guys? Because I mean, at that point, it was shell shock because it was really like Tri City was supposed to be this this dragon. And they proved they, they were a dragon in the first five minutes of that game. It was 4 nothing at the drop of a hat. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. A lot of that time is just, if you want, if you're this far into this, guys, then we have to figure out what you want to get out of this. There, were, I'm, I'm not into scaring people to do things. I, I don't think that's the way. To, but the only scary part at that point was you, you just, you pissed away a whole opportunity to do really great things if you don't want to take care of this moment right here. I think Dylan James scored in the next 15 seconds after the timeout. Yep. Um, and then that that started that. Our, our guys were just, you know, you you talk about the slew incident with Steber and in, in the getting in the fight. At that moment, at that moment of the series and that moment of the game, we didn't have that yet. We, I, I think they were like hoping it would go our way versus making sure it went our way. And darned if they didn't just pull up their boots together and and do it that way. And, I don't know. Sometimes those long, gross games are just good to get punched in the mouth first. Score with four seconds to go in the game. I think was the way that we won. Like, it, did that almost help us win that series? Because the way that we won game one is just seemed like it's they were so shell shocked at the end of that game. Like we just stole one from them in their own barn, and they probably hadn't really faced that kind of adversity that year. It really, it, you could just see it on their faces. It was something different. Well, especially the goalie was so talented for them. Yes. Um, Sergey was unreal. Uh, that part, I think, was a big piece. And then that momentum, as we all know, momentum at 16 to 20 year old is a pretty big piece of the puzzle. And um, that, that got us into game two. And then I think if you remember right, game two, they started the other guy in net. And that probably gave our guys a little shot in the arm, too. Like, we did it to him, we can do it to this guy, too. But they almost found a way to come back and, and make that because we almost they almost did the same exact effect on us as we had done on them in game one. Yeah, you guys had a lot of big names that came through Sioux City that year. You get you just mentioned Ben Steves on that fourth line, but uh, you know Dylan James, a, a Red Wings draft pick. Owen McLaughlin, you know he he's up at UND actually with James uh, Charlie Shane. Uh, he's in that famous call for Curtis. Uh, he was the last one to touch the puck before Nick Pierre for the yeah. overtime winner. Uh, you know, Ben Shimmick, who had a great year at Providence College this year. I mean, there was a lot of talent on that Clark Cup winning team, which you know, obviously so, but a lot of offensive firepower. Yeah, I'd blame Johns. <laughs> <laughs> I blame Johns in our scouting staff. Uh, the old, you shop the groceries and I'll cook it. So, uh, I thought there was a lot of factors like, you know, Owen McLaughlin, it, who knew that in one year he would be able to do that, that those numbers in one year. Those were astonishing numbers. Um, he, I remember giving him a hug after we won it all, and he's like almost crying. He's like, I didn't even score a goal, coach. I'm like, dude, that was the message in the beginning of this. It wasn't about – that into the same point of like Steve's comment earlier, like the, those guys were just able to check their ego. The best players were um, Charlie Shane in, in some regard, Charlie Pierre and, uh, and Kirkland Irie were, were aligned and scored both goals in the, in the championship game there to, to when we won it. Um, if someone say they were a fourth line, I don't know, but yeah. they're still going to play in overtime. They were, there was good enough to do all that. Charlie had, you know, a little bit of battle with some injury time, but 20, whatever, goals he had Kirky was our captain completely unsung hero did his job I mean painfully at times because like he wanted more production out of himself and it didn't really always happen except for his team game was incredible to make us win um Nikki just was a, the, the sophomore year of his of his time there that was coming out and I don't know what he ended up scoring 20 some goals himself. It, like those guys just did 
an incredible job. You talked about Bennett Shimmick. Shimmy was out for a, a, comp- a considerable measurable time with with injury, and we didn't really get we didn't really get Shimmy until after the first of the year. Like we got him for a hot second before Christmas, and then after Christmas he finally. So he was probably our freshest body at the time. And then you know you get into Slew Tabor Fowler like that's a pain in the backside line to play against a lot mm-hmm. pain. Um, and then Jamer's uh, the non, the nonstop motor, unbelievable human being winner of a kid, like moments, like they were just, in, they were incredible group. Where do the, what, uh, what, what would you guys, the USHL is a special place because you guys talk a lot. Like, I know you talk with other coaches and everybody else like that. And you guys have a lot of conversations. Um, you, you're texting. No big, all the time. no big deal. I still have my game card. Still the game <laughs> card. There it is. Look at that bad boy. Yep. Crazy. Who, who is, who is your defensive pairings that night? Carfania and, and Ralphie. Gratton and Antonacci. Lepidin, Garrett Brown, Will Smith, and Griffin Lutke. I remember being I remember being in in Waterloo and th- in in the first series and looking out there and like I'm looking around at people going, like Notch is playing an awful lot tonight. Like he's out there a ton. I and I remember going to the locker room after we won and I go, did Notch get extra time? And you guys all look at me and go, he's plus 32. Yeah, he's gonna get some time now. And <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea he was plus 32. There, there was a time where Nats wanted to get traded, for God's sake. Yeah. So that's part of the deal. I mean, that's it's part of what I think that group was all about. I was just looking at the five-on-five five goal totals. 58, a 44, a 31, and a 53 all on lines. That's unheard of. So. That's unheard of. So, like, what, what are some of the best compliments that you got about this team from opposing coaches after games? Or, like, you, you always hear – the stories after those championship teams where a guy coaches are like, just don't, you know, just don't put up six on us tonight. Or we, we had no chance. Or, I mean, did you, did you get a lot of that? Uh, yeah. You know, the biggest compliment I got was actually this year. Um, I had uh, taken, I, I think I was working for a house. It's weird. I was in, I was in the Tyson for three different teams in 12 months. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I, I think I was with Ohio State, and, and I was in recruiting, and Madison was in town, and um, it was because I was gonna I was dropping the puck. You had me out to to do yeah. that, and um, Clark Tommy Upton. Upton. Tommy Upton was there. Um, as is now, he had moved on. He was head coach of Madison. He was at he's at UMass. Corey's a coach, and we're talking, and we're talking right away. It kind of goes with, with if you get. Tommy and I together, it, it probably goes back to that series in a minute. Um, and he'd said, like, I knew we were in trouble when he goes, I listened to all your guys' press conference and all your media things you guys did. And he goes, I knew we were in trouble when all of you, all of your players, all of your staff, everyone spoke the exact same language and everyone talked about love. He goes, I thought our guys loved each other. They didn't even they they tried to show it, they wouldn't say it. He goes, You guys said it, did it, we're in trouble. I'm like, yeah. I thought you were in trouble too, because I warned that Madison had all this speed and they scored with ever what four minutes into the game and whole to- I told you so a moment. I'm like, all right, you dummies, like this is real. Like, yeah. I thought they were fast, they're really fast, and you guys touch the stove now. Now we know. Game one, drop game yep. one at, at home. But talk about love. You know, one of the most amazing things that we talk about is what sports can do. Um, it brought this community together for people that hadn't seen a hockey game in years were coming to hockey games again. Um, people that did come to hockey games consistently were falling deeper in love with the Musketeers and were invested in it. Um, you know, we talked about what this team did for this community is amazing. And, and nothing said that better than that. When we were playing in game four, I was brought to tears. Um, when we were at the hotel and there were people, I had friends or just acquaintances that I know are not big hockey fans. Like, like they're, they're not massive Musketeer fans. 
they were they were at the hotel in Madison. Some of our sponsors were at the hotel in Madison that made that drive to watch us play game four and possibly be a part of it. And I mean, I was in tears that day thinking, wow, this is such an unbelievable moment that we are able to we've been able to provide something for this town um, and give people this to cheer for. And they came all the way to Madison to see it happen. Um, just take me through that when we want it and people out on the ice, I mean, our fans, but that, that atmosphere and the fan base that came out even here, the Tyson through the playoffs, Luke, that I know you and I've talked about this plenty of times about how special that was for us. Um, but just, can you put that into words and what that meant and how that all you looking back on those memories of the people in, in this town without crying my eyes out? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I, um, I, you know, to your point the people that showed up in Madison drove, it's not like Madison is Sioux Falls. Like Madison's Eight. all a six hour drive mm-hmm. and not seven. And you were, you're in it. The weather thankfully had broke. So it was at least springtime, but um to be on the bench across the way and look in that the whole section, it wasn't a section. I remember Johnson and I buying tickets. He's like, how many? I'm like, I'm buying 13. He's like, I'm buying seven. I'm buying eight. I'm like, guys, that's we're at the 25s already. So that that was with just our room, our staff. Now you start to watch all these people coming over and people making a break on it for like game four day. Yeah. Like all the way across, like. Uh, it, it was it was neat. I mean, the guys actually, I can tell you, you can hear the guys like, holy, look, look at, the, and then you know, the flags waving, the faces painted, and the, and even I had friends that were being from there. I had probably my own assortment of people that became a Musketeer fan within that week. Anyways, um, <laughs> they they were like. Where do these people come from? Like, listen, man, they came from Sioux City. They yes. drove their the the whole deal. Um, it, incredible, and you know what? And outside of the boards for our guys to be in the community, to their amount of care that they didn't have to share. They're not from town. They're they'll come back to Sioux City because they now have a a really ingrained piece of it. But the way that they went about their business to show their own passion for the city and to show their own um, care factor for being a, a, a fabric of, of what's there. Um, that, that was on our guys. And that, that was probably a testament to the people we had as players and, you know, organizationally. Sure. Did, do we emphasize that we were going to go to miracle league and we were going to go do things that people didn't want to do on a cold, windy, crappy day in the playoffs and like, don't do it. Like, you guys need to focus on hockey. I'm like our guys have never. Fo- this is what we've done our whole time here. We're not going to stop it for now. So, yeah, yeah I, I remember. I don't know if you remember this. We were doing. It was like opening day Miracle League, and it was windy. Like it was terrible weather. And my like, guys, it's stress warm because we're not bailing. So, so you're, and they showed up and they're like, "This is terrible." They got out there for two seconds with those athletes and they're like this, change. Is the, this is the best thing in the world and i'm like yep you're not cold anymore so nope. but that was the guy that 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 was the people we had i was gonna say i know i i mean speaking of like you know you two are in the bubble but from being outside the bubble in your championship run yeah the entire town was uh the entire town was into it i remember uh exhibition game coming home from yankton listening to curtis call the final minutes of game three against tri-city uh we were all tuned in uh our season for the x's had just started i'm in kansas city calling baseball and i'm still get you know having getting score updates for you guys um i'm know. getting goosebumps right now by that story that you're telling connor i yeah. literally get goosebumps right now that's uh, awesome. we're you know we're the same thing and then you know the sunday you guys come to the ballpark i mean that was uh you know that was a lot of fun for us to have you guys there and you know watching watching guys win in ot and everything like that was uh a ton of fun, which obviously that was the culmination of your fourth, the uh, fourth Clark cup championship for the Sioux city Musketeers. I know uh, that was the 50th year anniversary for you guys. So um, I know you had brought back some championship teams and I've heard they've, they've came and, and, and spoke to you guys about, you know, Hey, look, this is what it took to win a championship. This is now what it means all these years later that we were able to win a championship. 
what kind of impact did those teams have on you? Mega. It was, um, you know, when, when you're, when you're thinking about the project to put the teams together to get like, that was Trev's leg work and, and heavy lifting of everyone going on. Um, but once they were there and you actually like felt like the Schaff's group that were there, that was about Super Bowl time. I know it yep. was Super Bowl time because he came for a Friday or a Saturday and stayed till a Monday. I think he's, so. I think, he, I think Schaff is still here somewhere as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> I would take him every day of the week. That's every sure. day. Um, but, but that group was, it was funny because that group was older and, but still connected. And our guys, I think, got a little bit of like, Ooh, that's a that's a neat. And then when the O2T came, like that was a different story because those guys, um, that was big time. And the way Dave Sociano handled it, the way Schwartzy and that group art, uh, their their just inspiring way of what they wanted to do, what they wanted to share. They felt they had a um an obligation to help our guys. Mm -hmm. 100%. Pretty powerful. That, I that many years removed to come back and, and and almost give the guys the warning signs of like, ooh, this almost went off the rails on this moment and this happened for us and not saying it has to happen for all of those things. Uh, a really powerful time. I remember even Kirkland at the time went and asked uh, Schwartzy after they they had talked and pulled him aside, captain to captain, and said, you know, and was picking his brain about getting certain guys to do certain things and, and, and being comfortable with, with their roles and whatnot. And they sat down and they talked and, and Schwartz gave him some great advice on stuff. And and like you were saying, it it was mega for those guys because I think the advice they gave them, and especially like I remember Art saying, be here, be present, be now. Yeah. Like the, the college scholarship stuff, the pro stuff, that's all going to happen for you guys. But you have one moment, one year right now to live this life, live it, and don't think about anything else. Yeah, they shared some stories I wish they wouldn't have. And so we're going to <laughs> Zamboni, <laughs> yes, the Zamboni story for one. That was that, yeah, that was. Uh, but you know, with that, and I, I think actually, if you, I'm almost certain Schwartz, he bought Kirky's jersey that night. I know Gar yeah, Garris bought bought one as well. Garrett, Art yeah. bought one. Yeah, amazing. Just amazing guys. And you know, they uh the old money on the board thing was pretty impressive. I uh I had heard a story, uh Travis had told me you you oh. won your two hundred and fiftieth game, right? And there's this two hundred his two hundredth game. Or two hundredth game. You won your two hundredth game here. Travis has this whole elaborate ceremony planned out where basically, okay, no matter what, like you're the number one star. It doesn't matter if someone scores 10 goals tonight. Like you're the number one star of the game. And I'm not sure it, Travis doesn't remember like what you were upset about. Cause you're like storming to the locker room and Travis like, well, you're the first star. And you're like, Nope, I don't care. And do you remember, do you remember that night? Do you remember what, what you were upset about that you didn't want to be the first star of the game? You had just won game number 200 and, and you were, you were mad about something. You were so you you came off, and you and I have been in like two arguments in our, in the like the in the fifteen years that you and I have been friends, and we've like barked at each other twice. And you came off I'm like your number. You're like I'm not doing it. I'm going in here. No, I'm no. And and you were already upset walking off the bench, and I I can't remember why. I, it might have been because we gave up a shutout or something like that. But do you remember what it was? No, I mean we we were we were trying to play for the zero. That was a big theme that we had as well. But we did give up a late goal. I yeah, not to say that that type of thing sets me off, but that <laughs> probably sets me off. And then part two, as you know, Trav, like it it was uh, it was about the guys. And then, so all the guys are standing there. You'll appreciate this, Connor. So all the guys are standing there. And Luke and like Luke's yelling at me in the tunnel. He's like, I'm not going out there, boy. And turns around. And right when he turns around, there's Kirky and all the guys standing with this massive picture <laughs> plaque of Luke's picture, 200 across. And I think Luke turns around. He's like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and off and out and out we went to the ice. And and then it was like, 
he realized like, oh man, okay, yeah, this is this is going on. And then yeah. out, out to the ice we went. But to that point, Luke, you know, I, that was an emotional interview for both you and I because I know how much you cared about winning 200 is great, but winning 200 for Sioux City probably meant more to you than anything else. By far. I mean, uh, yeah, great spot. I came to say, like, there's too many people, places, memories, time. Um, yeah. They, those regular season games are fun, but fire truck parade was probably the best. <laughs> so we win a we win the Clark Cup. Luke has Clarky sitting beside him the, the entire trip back from Madison. And I tell him, like, take pictures of you guys rolling back into town. So they, they have they have video of us rolling back into town, the Clark Cup and everything else, and getting off with Clarky. And, and so we have literally 24 hours to set up this big parade of how we're gonna do this thing and, and with videos and and all of it. And so I have this thing timed out to the second on when these guys are going to have to leave. They're, they're over here by the, by the Musketeers office behind the old auditorium. Okay. We have two fire trucks set for these guys. Okay. I tell the boys and I tell the firemen, I'm like, you need to leave, start driving the trucks at this time. Exactly. Okay. No problem. We're on it. Okay. So here we are, I'm, me, it's me and Lloyd and Curtis, and we're up on stage and we're, we go through this, this intro thing and I throw to the video that we, that I created, you know, and it's us winning and, and all this, and the crowd's just like fever pitch, you know, like ready, where's these players at? And I said, we waited 20 years, here we go, here's your Musketeers, knowing that the, the fire truck's got to be coming around here any second because they, they left a minute ago, so they should be here. Celebration plays once, okay? The entire the entire song, Celebration Plays Once. They were supposed to be out there for like 30 seconds into the song. Celebration plays twice. And as we're in the second celebration, I'm on my phone on stage. I'm like, where are you? Where is everybody? And they're like, <laughs> somebody says, we're not even on the truck yet. And I'm like, oh my God. So somebody ran around. He's like, get them on the truck and get them, get them right now. And it we're was on, like, we were on Travis time. It was like, it was, you were on the one <laughs> there's time. There's Marty I, time ooh, and then there's Trav time. There was the one time that I was like on time to, to do it. And they're there, over, they're over there. And I'm like, get on the truck. Like herding cat. I think that was, that was Luke's term. He's like, Travis, like herding cats right now. I'm I'm trying. Uh, uh, you know the the scoreboard had a, a championship message up on it into inside. Uh, the guys were still like, man, yeah, it was hard to get them on the fire truck, literally too. But <laughs> they, were, they were good. You know the other the other funny part about that, Trav, that you say that because the guys actually expected Cool and the gang to be there, not just. Yeah. <laughs> I had 24 hours. I had 24 hours notice. Not much I could do. I was this close. I was this yeah. close. Hey, so give me give me one or two of your favorite stories that when, when people ask you about that team or ask like, like they tell me the, the most memorable story, even the good the good one that people haven't heard or something like that. Um even a, a PG 13 story or an R story is good, it's fine. But the one or two stories that you look back on and go, man, that was a, that was a moment. You know what? It, it's kind of a culmination of everything. Cause like there's a lot of individual success inside that team. Um, that has really gone by the way, like the, the year that Jamer had the number of goals that, that Steber scores, the number of points that Owen has Tracy, like I, there was probably a moment in time during the year when I was like, now that Trace and I are back together, I can tell you this. Like, I don't know what was going on, but do you remember the time you did the commercial with the sunglasses? Is like beach night at the rink. Hundred percent. Yeah, him yeah. and Axe wore sunglasses at, at practice. So, if you ever really want to get on the bad side, any marketer out there listening to uh, on a coach, it's come out to practice when maybe the goalie's not playing so hot, and offer the idea that now the goalie. It was getting scored on at a pretty higher rate than they normally would already 
without the sunglasses on, is getting scored on in practice with sunglasses on, pretend he can't see the puck. And I'm actually saying, I don't know if he can't see the puck right now either. Right, without sunglasses. Without sunglasses. Yes. And as we all know, Trav's pretty intimate about, like, I've got this idea and this is going to work. My imagination is on. This is going to all come together. Ooh, boy. In the first couple of years, I remember you asking him, like, just don't move. I'm like, oh, he's got that down pat right now. This is easy. <laughs> I'm this. Um, I probably have some sarcasm that I live on a little bit in some that regard, but uh, that that was a big one. Uh, like those funny, like I got winners with chance, and that, that was the mini the mini stick the commercial. Mini stick, yep. I uh, want to ask, like, what is your favorite Travis Morgan commercial? Uh, the one that can never be seen before Trav, correct? Uh, yes, that, the highlight, the, the highlight yeah, reel, yeah. It, I, I put I put all of all of Luke's outtakes on a reel and shared it with. It was literally with I sent it to him, and that was <laughs> the only person that got it. It was him, and uh, that outtake reel is absolutely priceless. But I think my favorite one with with us, like we got winners the the, the mini stick one, but the the serve pro uh, the serve pro one with the. Uh, with the broken smoke detectors, probably is my favorite of all time. That was that was so good. That was, so that was good. actually real accurate at that point. That was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And, and the best part was I get I get I get Luke like the script and be nervous like okay is it and he would nail it every time like I'm like <laughs> look at this guy he's just got the acting chops but without question Alex Tracy was the best actor on the team though. Like Trace was the go to, he was always my go to to get like the great story. Get to get to, he, he'd make the commercials better. He made some good stories with Seaver. He looked like a regular Ralphie, not so much, but Seaver no. could do it. Yeah. Axel, not so much. No. Uh, you know, I did the other, I mean, the part that goes like unsung is like the support internally, billets, um, the family connection to see all of the impact of lives and now a year a year removed because now like one year out of coaching those guys i coached against a lot of them this year um we have definitely stayed in connection uh, in some regard like we had the ring reveal um that type of thing it, it was just amazing to see their growth their maturity like just crazy amazing um th- those pieces are are awesome and I, I also think the um, the people that don't probably understand is like the amount of work that Colton, oh yeah, Colton St. Clair, Mike Finelli, Jackie, Damon, Cliffy, the amount of work that those guys do. Besides Andy and all of the scouting staff, Sean Clark, Keegan Bell, like those guys, those are are monster backdrop pieces of things that have to happen that get zero credit when the because you've won and so now it's like on to the next type of thing and they were such a big piece of the puzzle it's crazy the other part that I, I i i haven't been around the hockey world long enough to understand this or know this and i've never even asked you this before but is it is it fairly common like this was a very tight organization like Everybody loved each other. We all got along great. I mean, we spent time back there all the time. You guys were up here a lot. Is is that pretty common or for, for championship teams or for teams in general? Or is that is that kind of an odd for everybody to get along that well from top to bottom? I wouldn't say it's common. I, I think it, it takes you takes work. We all had to work at it, no question. But um I think when you find the value of the front of the kitchen per se to the back, like uh, the, those those are all the appreciation I think that our players had for for you guys and what you guys did up front and the ticket holders and the selling and the buy. I I thought it was a great, but I do I do know the more that people are around each other, the better off things are, and it was definitely a, a great family feel. You you talk about that like how everyone gets together, and I think it it says it right on your rings, you know, together forever, never depart. I mean. <laughs> we we sit here you laugh you talk all about these stories and about everybody that played all together i mean this this team will always be the the 2021-22 Sioux City Musketeers they will always be together right 
Yeah, it's funny, funny on my game card um, on the back. I have three periods on my game card, so I don't have overtime. So there's overtime. I just wrote it. And on the mirror in the, in the room, I wrote together for that two uh, two G four E N two P on the on the mirror in the room. And it was the only message that we need, and which made sense to me, you guys, because I'm I'm I use a lot of acronyms the way it is. Steber thought it was a Wi-Fi password. <laughs> Afterwards, we talked about it. And the guys, like, then I found out they thought, I'm like, oh, here I am, the smart coach, the smartest coach in the world. <laughs> and they thought it was the damn internet password. Yeah, everyone's on their phones logging in. Now, whatever they're thinking they need on the internet going into overtime is probably another piece of the puzzle for this crew. But yeah, I don't know. Like, just, just amazing. We always joke, like, success leaves clues. And our kids were successful on the ice, off the ice. They did. They enjoyed impacting every every piece of the Sulan. Not just on the ice, but off the ice too. Well, yeah, coach, it's 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 always special to talk about it. I know you, just the conversations. Every time we talk, there's something new comes up that a story that we hear and whatnot, and it's just it's fun to give. The, the Musketeer fans or USHL fans a chance to just kind of look at this team from behind the curtain, a peek behind the curtain a little bit. And it sure is fun to talk about it. There's no question about that. Yeah. Uh, memory, memories forever. And uh, we always can't wait to get back there and it'll be some point. It'll be our turn to come back and talk to a team and, and that'll be excited to do that. And I can't wait for, I, I think I told both coach, I told Fargo's coach and I told young sounds coach, before their series, they both called asking some things, but I told both of them, I said, you know, it's, it's such an amazing journey and you win and you're so immensely in, emerged and submerged into everything that's going on. And then it hits you that that's the last time you coach those kids. Mm -hmm. That sucks. I think, uh, the I've already got a future question written down whenever we have Ben Steves on is your Wi-Fi password now the together forever <laughs> never too far. I hope it is. That'd be fantastic. That, that, that's his password to everything. Yeah. That's his password to uh, everything. We we do all connect still, and it's pretty cool because that's uh some of those things that I thought um I thought were meaningless were were very meaningful to those guys, and vice versa. Some of the things they thought were like off the cuff that I, I took to heart. And they're like, oh, wow, you remember that? I'm like, oh, yeah, buddy. Like, that's part of the deal. <laughs> Luke's handing out yeah. a lot of Wi Fi passwords. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> there, there could be a, you could do a segment on every one of those guys because every one of those guys would have a, um, a path to this, to this part of the journey, to the actual reward of it that, a lot of us probably wouldn't be able to talk about like you're talking about guys going back and forth and you're talking visa problems and you're talking yeah. putting guys from all over the world together. And, uh, but praise Andy, uh, Andy Johnson and all of his staff, because it doesn't, uh, I, I do remember the trade line there, uh, trade deadline. And everyone's like, are we getting another who's the next like And Johnson came in and he's like, we're not trading for anyone else. This is our group. We believe in you. This is shut done deal. And you could really, I thought the guys really took off after that because then they're like, okay, this is, we are, there's no one else needed for here. And I don't know. I think they lost two more games the rest of the year. Total. What, one last, one quick question. We got to wrap it up, but raising that Clark Cup, what's it, what's, I mean, what was that like? I mean, I, I it was, yeah, for you. Now that I've seen my face, I look like I want to eat the thing instead of just kiss it. But like, <laughs> uh, just, emotion like it doesn't matter like it could have been the stanley cup someone could say like oh it's not the stanley i would have said like well, you want to bet like yeah no, it sure feels like it so i don't know just that that cup is just for me it's it's like the putting the ring on your finger for your family like, that just was it just what it was it meant together like that was uh but yeah i mean i i got home and took a quick nap with the cup when i got home and it woke up next to me just fine it was good 
I was going to say there is there. Trust me, I've I've made a few graphics now. I, there is no picture of Luke without a, a just expression on his face when he's holding that cup. There is no emotionless expression yeah. for him. You could tell it meant a lot for yeah. him. So for sure, yeah. Um, but no, I, this is a a great way to start off. Musketeers made again, and uh, uh, Luke, we appreciate you taking the time to uh, chat with us and uh, rehash some old memories. Awesome. I appreciate you guys. Go to live. All right. That was the head coach of the Sioux City Musketeers Clark Cup team in 2022, Luke Strand, and now the head coach for the Minnesota State Mankato Mavericks.